I'd like to pay my respect uh, to their elders past and present. And I extend that uh, respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, this webinar, it was originally Chris and I had a chat and we thought, how are we going to get our cadets together? How are we going to launch it? You know, I know cadets is a very cadet driven thing, but you know, for our first gig, get everyone in the same room. And as so I said, well, I really want to see people get jobs. That's what I care about, you know, and even if you're still studying, you still need to get that resume together, right? So why don't we do that? And we thought, yeah, that'd be really cool. Let's do that. Well, sadly, COVID has taken over our world in so many horrendous ways, obviously. Uh, we're all affected. And we realised that this needed to have a broader reach and that there are, on this call especially, some pretty heavy hitting women with deep and brilliant experiences under their belt. And a lot of us are facing some pretty big challenges in terms of our employment currently. Uh, so we extended it out. We thought, no, let's throw out the net and share this with everyone. Um, as a, a little bit of background, for me personally, I believe that keeping women in security is more important now than ever. Um, it's one thing to get everyone in. We've already got low numbers. Uh, but if we look at other professions where there have been leaky pipelines, we cannot afford a COVID leak in our pipeline. Just it, We just can't allow it. If we look at uh, the Workplace Gender Equity Agency, which I had a quick look at today, as of May last year, the pay gap was at 14% overall throughout all professions. If we look to, if you classify yourself in either of these categories, either information, media and telecoms, as of November last year, it was at 17.2%. If you classify yourself as being professional, scientific or technical services, 22.1%. That's big. And when we're talking about firms who are either shedding staff or reducing the wages of staff, if we look at that last figure, a 20% cut in a man's wage, he's still not where his equivalent female was before COVID. Okay. So I'm really, really passionate about seeing women get in, women stay in, and get the best jobs possible and the best pay possible, okay? It's more important than ever. Tomorrow, uh, one of my dearest friends in the profession is exiting stage left. Her firm has made her position redundant and she's decided to reskill. So it's fresh, it's raw, it's personal. For me personally, I had a career uh, before the GFC hit where I didn't need a resume. Everyone knew who I was. They knew what I did. It was all relationship, relationship. People knew if they wanted me and they hired me. It was happy days. And then everything closed in. And all of a sudden, I found myself having to explain who I was, what my skills were, and yeah, they're real, and yeah, they're worthwhile to people who just didn't get it even just to get in the door. And I don't want to see my friends in uh, security, particularly information security, suffer that same fate. So today, on a more positive note, we've got three awesome recruiters from the InfoSec community. And they've not only offered us their time today, but they've also offered to help individuals review their resumes and hone them and make life a lot easier for them, I would suggest. So without any more from me, before we kick off, um, each of our recruiters have very unique experiences. So I thought we'd go Nicole, Subi, Ricky. So if you could give us each your elevator pitch and just tell us a little bit about yourself and your specialty, please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nicole. Um, I'm currently the general manager for People Bank in the ACT. Um, my career in recruitment started back in 1993. Um, I'm sure way before many of you were born. Um, 
I specialised in IT and predominantly here in Canberra, uh, but since that time I have also uh, worked across most white collar industries, uh, again predominantly here in the ACT, but also Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. Thanks. Thanks. Hi everyone, um, I'm Subi. I am currently working as the account manager with Ignite. Um, I am um, going back uh, before recruitment. I actually am a mechanical engineering graduate. And I actually, after mechanical engineering and automation degree, I started my career in IT. Um, and after working in IT for five years, when I moved to Australia, like a lot of people face, um, you know, visa problems and all the other sort of problems getting into a job. I actually changed my career and started in recruitment. And I've been now in recruitment, um, IT recruitment for over 11, around 11 years. And um, yeah, and I've been recruiting for federal government contract or sort of IT roles. Yeah, thanks. That's me. Ricky. Hi, um, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Ricky Burke. I run a company called CyberSec People. I have been recruiting a while, so not not quite as long as Nicole, but uh, started in recruitment in 2000 um, and specialised in cybersecurity for about four years now. Um, I'm pretty active in the security community. I've spoken at lots of conferences. I'm very involved in running stuff as well. Um, I just like to be involved, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of people that need help in this space. Um, so whether it's a student, whether it's the women in from the diversity point of view, this industry needs help. There's a massive gap here in terms of the people in it and people that want to get into it or want people that want to progress. Um, so um, I think like, like Nicole and, and Subri as well, there's lots of stuff we can do and hopefully um, people can learn a thing or two along the way as well. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And that goes to the next question that we have around the state of the market, um, because obviously we all know firms have been impacted, employers have been impacted. Um, so we'll do the whip round again, same order. Uh, so we'll start with you, Nicole. How do you think things have changed in your market niche? Yeah, so I brought along some stats today to kind of give an indication of what's happening overall. So we see, we've see we seen more than a 50% decline in, in jobs overall across the country. Uh, there's been a 32% decline in IT roles. And um, in the security sector, IT security sector, a 12% decrease. So for this particular cohort, there's a better chance than most of actually picking something up <laughs> if there's a positive. <laughs> Thanks, Subi. Um, so, yes, yeah, so Nicole has obviously covered the stats. Um, I had some stats, so I won't go into those. But, um, yes, definitely contracting permanent market has slowed down, especially um, in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. Um, Canberra has been, um, obviously, it's slowed down in Canberra with federal government, but it is, I'm hearing it's not as bad as it is in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane um, and all other states. Uh, we have a lot of candidates looking and moving to come to Canberra because federal government is still a little bit steady and considering you know we've got you know ACT in a very good position with in terms of COVID-19 cases we've seen in the last two weeks the market has actually picked up quite significantly um, as compared okay. to what it was two months ago um, so um, and more and more restrictions going to lift up and hopefully we don't get a second wave I think mm. our market is going to definitely pick up back again Good news. What about you, Ricky? In a less articulated way, it's crap. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's a different market than what it was two months ago. Um, but that said, this is a unique space, unique industry. And I think this time more than any other time, niche skills, specific skills stand out more. Um, and what's worth bearing in mind is COVID nineteen is hitting, impacting us in many different ways, but it's not negatively impacting every business or every industry. So yes, as a whole, it doesn't look very good. But when you look sort of on a micro basis, there's some companies doing really well right now, or they're at least not negatively impacted. So there's still opportunities out there and you just got to look on, I guess, more of an individual basis. Interesting. So 
Subi, um, your personal experience, um, as you said the other day, transitioning uh, from one profession uh, into recruiting, um, I'm finding a lot of our AWSN members in Canberra are coming to me with similar stories, uh, particularly in the cadet space. So this isn't their first rodeo. They've got really great qualifications under their belt, like yours in mechanical engineering and, and so forth. Um, but they're quite nervous because they said, well, I, I worry about being relevant and how do I explain myself? So what sort of advice do you have uh, to candidates who are struggling in that way? Uh, see, going back to my story, I mean, from mechanical engineering and working in IT, working in IT recruitment was a little bit easier because I didn't know the recruitment side of things which I could get trained on but I knew the IT side of things that actually yeah. helped me. So okay. any skills that you can leverage on, um, you know, talk to people. I feel degree, certification, experience, that's all very necessary, but anyone starting out, anyone trying to change their careers, I feel networking is, um, is very, very important. Yeah. Um, we have organizations like yourself, AWSN, which brings all these cybersecurity people together um, I suggest people to talk, um, reach out to people, don't be hesitant. I've got success stories, someone finishing up a CIT course, um, working out as um, a cleaner in a government department and reaching out and talking to every director on the floor and he got an opportunity, you know. Wow. So it's, it's, it's all about talking and putting yourself out there. Yeah, um, yeah so, um, you know, Going into cybersecurity, you will have to polish your computing skills, do some certifications, and then reach out. And you'll have to start, unfortunately, at the lower end of the market. Um, I wouldn't expect starting out as a manager, secure cybersecurity business continuity manager somewhere, if yeah. you start out. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, Nicole, you do predominantly a lot, a lot of work recruiting for government or organisations that support government. Um, can you describe for people, particularly in state cohorts, uh, the differences between going for, say, a job with a bank or a small business to going for a federal government role? Yeah, so I gave a lot of thought to, uh, to what the differences are. And I think first and foremost with uh, federal government, uh, and this isn't necessarily any different to most organisations, but it's paramount, is probity. Uh, follow the rules. Um, one of the number one uh, requirements for federal government will be uh, Australian citizens only, um, and you must be able to uh, apply for and hold a security clearance. Uh, which can often mean up to a 10 year or more uh, footprint in Australia. So it reduces the, um, the applicant uh, pool and puts some fairly stringent requirements on applying. Uh, but following the rules, I think, is, is probably um, the number one point. So they'll be very clear with you about what their recruitment process is and what you can and can't do, who you can and can't speak to. So if they give you an opportunity to be able to speak to uh, someone within the HR area, by all means reach out. Um, but don't pick up the phone or try and LinkedIn stalk the hiring manager uh, because that's the quickest way to have you removed uh, from the shortlist. <laughs> looks very lethal. <laughs> uh, Ricky, I, as you know, I've been enjoying your little sound bites that you've been posting on LinkedIn. Um, and that leads to my next question. You did one yesterday around certification. And I was, my general question was around um, when a candidate's starting out, uh, what advice do you give them? Because there's a lot of highly specialised roles. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, first of all, people need to be comfortable with the truth or the, the situation out there. And basically, first of all, don't believe the headlines about a skill shortage. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of requirements out there, but they're at levels where they're not entry level. So yeah. there are far more people that want to get into this industry compared to with the number of jobs that are actually out there. So with 
every single university pretty much pumping out new cybersecurity graduates every year and people from other industries want to get in security there's the numbers are far different so i think appreciate that that it's not going to be an easy thing to do um and then i guess my main thing that i go talk about a lot is sort of working backwards so security is a massive space that require lots of different skill sets um, I, I compare it when um, when someone says I want to get into security, and I, I ask them, "What do you want to do?" And they just say, "I, I just want to get in. I just want my foot in the door, get a job in the industry." It's like someone saying to you, "I want to work in healthcare." Okay, but what do you want to be? A doctor, a nurse, dentist? You know, the list goes on, and they're all different skill sets. And I think you need to appreciate that different areas have different skills, and you need to be able to demonstrate you have some sort of skills that a company can use to actually get your foot in the door so are you more blue team orientated are you more risk um, compliance and i think once you know the area that you want to work in then you know what sort of skills you can actually work or learn towards um, certifications are good but you don't always need them i think it's more important to actually learn the skills used in a job itself and then you have something to offer a company rather than just a generic you know i'm a x and i can do this but you don't stand out otherwise and i think having the skills helps you stand out thank you um Subi, i'm interested in how best to tailor your resume for the job it's something i always struggle with um what's your, what's your hot tips um that's something like we discuss with candidates um you know every day probably a few few different candidates in on a day-to-day -day basis basically what I struggle to see um, in people's CV is um, they have a very generic CV and, um, and they don't want to tailor it or they don't know how to tailor it. So the best tip is to read the job requirement you're applying for. People look at a so job requirement always has two parts to it. The first part is what the roles and responsibility of that role is going to be and what are the skills required to, for you to be able to do that. So write what you've actually done based on roles and responsibilities, not necessarily so much around the skills. That skills are really important and those certifications are important, but also don't forget what they actually want you to do. For example, I saw um, um, a cybersecurity specialist um, um, job description two days ago, and it had, um, it had a role and responsibility mentioning that someone will have to do audit investigations. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it didn't have any mention of that in skills or experience required as an audit. So they needed five years of cybersecurity, they need some certification and stuff like that. So people kind of forget to pick those keywords and use that in your CV. So you need, you may have done it, but then your CV is going first to a recruitment consultant, then possibly to a HR person, then probably to a program manager, and then to a technical person. It, it's not gonna even put past the first layer of a recruiter because you have not done those audits. So spell it out for a recruiter, spell it out for um, the HR person who's gonna read the CV based on the roles and requirements. So don't it, take it for granted that yeah. what you've done is obvious. Yeah, don't assume, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have made that flaw many times. <laughs> Yeah, so basically tailoring that your first page yeah. of um or your cover letter or something like that to tailor it to yeah mm. to the Oops. job requirement. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so Nicole, you see well you all do, but I'm asking you first. You see a bunch of resumes. You guys would see more resumes than yeah, I care to think. What are the common flaws? Where where do you think people fall over? I think the number one thing is spelling and grammar. Um, they will bring you undone every single time because I guarantee you on the list of requirements coming from uh, the job description, it will say attention to detail. So <laughs> if you make a spelling mistake or your grammar is poor or you mix up your theirs and your theirs, uh, you're gonna be in trouble. Um, so I guess another part of having attention to detail is knowing how to apply attention to detail, which will also be a question in the criteria. Um, so make sure you have um, a 
problem solving solution for that. So um, a second set of eyes, uh, you know, take a fresh look, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the other components there, and Surabhi's already touched on it, is lacking detail. Uh, so be, be specific, uh, talk about um, how you've used those skills, uh, your responsibilities, um, but the achievements as well. Um, and be authentic. Um, there's no point saying that you did X, Y, and Z uh, if you can't back it up with detail, if you're asked a probing question about that at interview, or you need to provide more detail in a selection criteria. Uh, so be honest about your part uh, in whichever program or task or piece of work that you're doing um, and be able to recount that. That's very good advice. And it leads me to Ricky, uh, you put a really good LinkedIn post just recently talking about people bluffing their way through interviews. How, what, what advice, uh, feeding off what Nicole has mentioned also, what advice do you give to people? Um, say, for instance, if they don't have all of the skills or the requirements of the job role, how should that be addressed? Just highlight where they do actually um, have the skills. I think um, really good points made so far and they're, they're exactly the same points I'd recommend to people. And I think you need to sell yourself and your strengths, not your, not your weaknesses. So people don't need an eight page CV. They should never have an eight page CV. Um, <laughs> so realistically, a lot of companies or hiring managers we speak to, they, they want a condensed version of CVs these days. They want a two page CV maximum. So, Pretty controversial there, Ricky. <laughs> Only passing on feedback. Um, but people don't have time to read six and ten page CVs. So I think you know you you want to you want you want to sell yourself self on your strengths and the information that stands out. Um, going back to the point of reading the actual job description, highlighting the points that you do have. Um, that's how someone can quickly identify. Yes, you actually can do the job. Um, that's probably one of the main things, to be honest. Yeah, in our um, preparation discussions, we did have some interesting banter about this. So let's do a survey. Subi, you interjected quite passionately, and then we'll hear from Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> CV length. Um, so I honestly don't think there is a right or a wrong length, unless a client has specifically asked for that particular role that I don't want to see more than two pages of CV. I've had clients who uh, want more details because they could um, pick up from their skills they've done. For example, um, a program manager might be applying for um, a role, but they've come from developer that was 20 years ago. That is relevant because, you know, you want to you wanna highlight that you come from technical background. So there's no right or wrong. Yes, you don't want to write 20 pages. You don't want to write an essay, but your first two pages, or at least your first page should capture your, the attention of a recruiter or a hiring manager to go to the second page or third page. Um, unless yeah, unless um, there's a specific requirement saying you can't have more than 500 words or you know, a two page CV. Okay. What about you, Nicole? Um, yeah, I tend to agree a little bit more with Surabhi and I think that's probably um, mostly to do with our client base um, here in Canberra in particular. Um, so again, you know, a, a two page resume is okay if that's what the client is, is after. And yes, Ricky's right, they're probably unlikely to go much beyond the, the first page or the second page if you don't capture their attention in that initial summary uh, with your uh, e executive summary, if you like, your, your skills and experience and, and those couple of dot points about why you're probably most suited to the role. Um, but I do agree with Surabhi, the detail needs to be in there and particularly. Um, if you think about, again, the different um, uh, people that you're applying to, so where you're applying to a recruitment agency, uh, and this is very generic, um, your resume will be held um, in an applicant tracking system um, and keywords will be searched upon. 
uh, to identify you as being a potential candidate to contact about a particular role. So uh, if you haven't mentioned that 20 years ago uh, you were in a technical role and then you've gone out of it, but now you want to get back into it again, then they're not going to be able to see that or at least pick up on that. So the detail at the back end of your resume is definitely going to be more condensed um, and the most detail is going to be upfront with your um, most recent, say, three to five years, depending on what you're applying for. So horses for courses, I guess, is probably the overarching uh, answer. Diplomatic. So, Ricky, people often tell us before we get to interview to research an organisation. But since resume, particularly in the current environment, is generally the first step, how relevant is research and how much effort should you put into it? What sort of things should we be looking for if we are researching an organisation? You mean in terms of where someone would like to apply? Yeah, yeah. So if you see a job advertised and you go, yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, generally, before you go to interview, you'd be looking at the very least to find out who's who in the zoo, mission statements, you know. Yeah, I think people should always have a targeted approach. Um, now, some things are easier, like obviously we're, we're going to have different points of view. So I, my experience is predominantly um, non-government. So it's more organizations, companies, enterprise companies, startups. Um, so very different, I guess, approach. But you would want to understand, is that the culture for you? You can research on LinkedIn, who's already working there, what type of skills people have, what sort of backgrounds they have. So... And also just talking with people like you, you could see a job advert online and you could see that, you know, search the company, you might see someone, you know, used to work at that business and get really bad feedback and say, that's a terrible manager or bad culture. So I think it's helpful. Um, the sort of shotgun or scattergun approach doesn't really work. And I think if you have a more tailored approach, not just in your CV, but also the, the search itself, um, then you're applying for suitable roles because in different roles i.e if you're a SOC analyst or seam engineer or if you're a app application security engineer there's not there's not fifty thousand jobs out there this isn't san francisco where there's a thousand jobs for each role so realistically the number's going to be quite small anyway you mentioned linkedin um i know that you guys obviously live and breathe and live and die from linkedin profiles too much. Um, and also the one that came up the other day when we were preparing was Seek, which I hadn't even considered. So what's, oh, we'll do the whip around again. Um, may as well start with you, Subi, because your microphone's on. Uh, how important uh, is your LinkedIn profile and um, do you recommend a Seek profile? What, what are your thoughts on each of those? Absolutely, because um, these days, uh, with new and new skills emerging in the market, um, we might not have um, people's, um, you know, up-to-date CVs on a database because we they might have changed to like cloud or cyber security. This is all emerging. A lot of people getting into it. So keeping your LinkedIn profile up to date, your Seek profile up to date, it's very important because as a recruiter, we spend a lot of time looking at LinkedIn and um, and Seek. Um, and I think we were discussing the other day, but you need to be, if you're working for federal government or secure um, organisation, you need to be very, 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 very of who you're connected with uh, mm. also, uh, but also build your network around it. And if you're active on LinkedIn, you know, mark yourself active. There's a lot of ways you can actually mark yourself active and stuff because, um, yeah, people do look there. And organ um, hiring managers do... Um, check if if you're sending a CV through, make sure your CV is same as what you've got on Seek or on LinkedIn. We've had people with different words and different job titles and you ain't getting a job. <laughs> Comes back to bluffing, really. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. You've got to be very smart with that. Yes. Good call. Uh, Nicole, your advice? I really don't have anything to add. I think Surabhi's probably covered it quite nicely there. <laughs> what about you, Ricky? Same. Um, if you're looking for a job, you need to be found and you just need, you know, more awareness and 
Yeah. Um, like as a recruiter, my process, again, we're all going to have slightly different things, but when I'm looking for someone for a new role, then I'll go data, our database and then LinkedIn and then maybe seek. So, okay. um, yeah, like we'll always search database first because we'll have those people's contact details and stuff like that. Um, but rightly okay. so things change and LinkedIn is a good place to look. So we'll, I, as a recruiter, use LinkedIn like a database. I'll do my searches. We'll, we've got sort of different licenses and stuff that we have. So we've got different versions of LinkedIn that we use. We'll do our keyword searches and then we'll scan people's profiles. Um, it's just, okay. yeah, so keywords are very important. Okay, so I'm, I'm hearing that come up a lot. Um, keywords in both your resume and your online footprint. Um, so that's actually really powerful information, I think, uh, to know to include that in what you're doing. Um, the, sorry, Kathleen, I just yeah. want to add on LinkedIn, um, you know, how we, because we've been talking about telling your resume to the job requirement. I've had mm. someone ask me, well, I can't keep changing my LinkedIn profile every minute, right? Um, so how do I keep it consistent? So your LinkedIn profile is not as detailed as your resume is, okay? You need to have consistent your job titles, where you're working, if you can disclose that, all those kind of things and have a generic profile, which you can build on your resume basically for the job requirement that you're putting in. So you can add more details in your resume. Mm. Yeah. yeah, the other one I had triggered my mind, Ricky, was when you mentioned about how you go to your internal database first and then you go through. So one of the things, I, I think sometimes it's discouraging when you call a recruiter and they say, oh, sorry, that job's been filled. Send us your resume anyway. And you're kind of like, oh, really? <laughs> so are you guys saying this is why? Like this this is the value? Well, we, we don't know what's coming up tomorrow. So mm -hmm. we, we, we could fill that job and it's gone today. But if we get the same sort of requirement in tomorrow or next week or whenever it is, then we want to be able to let people know. And the more up-to-date and relevant information we have, then the more people we can be in touch with. Okay. I think too, just to add there, uh, is an opportunity to build a relationship with your recruiter. Um, if you have that relationship, then they're more likely to think of you when the next role comes through uh, and will always give preference to those candidates who are already known to us and working with us. And as Ricky says, sometimes there's a really fast turnaround and there just isn't time to put an ad out and do a full uh, scale um, process. So we'll already have pre-qualified those candidates who are on our database. So uh, it also means that sometimes when those niche opportunities come through, uh, we're more likely uh, to know and understand the nuances of the culture of an environment that you might uh, be best suited to uh, if we've got that relationship with you. Okay, Sibi, do you, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, that's pretty much it, yeah. Cool. All right. So, um, Chris, I actually can't see um, the questions coming in. Um, would you like to take over for a moment, or Susanna, um, if there's any questions from the broader group, please? None yet. None yet? All right. Well, here's, here's a question for you guys, because, you know, some of us, we're pretty technical, you know, we know stuff and stuff the general population generally doesn't, you yeah, know, and, and we speak, <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> we got one, headshots, oh, good. yes or no? Oh, yes. No. No. There's, there's two no's, Rick. I'm oh, sorry, go. Yeah, I would say don't put anything in your CV that can cause discrimination. You don't need to put your female or male. You don't need to put what your age is. You don't need to put your head shot in. No. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with uh, with Surabi. And often if, uh, and just to kind of touch on the federal government recruitment process uh, for permanent uh, roles, um, is they must uh, retain that unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. So um, very important not to include um, your latest mug shot um, or your glamour shot or, <laughs> or the one where you've got your partner cut out of the picture, <laughs> please, no. 
<laughs> no drugged tigers in Thailand. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help myself. Right. Ricky, but definitely do you... from a discrimination perspective, yeah, you want to avoid yeah. that. What What about you, Ricky? What's your thoughts? Um, I used to, I used to say no, um, but I'm fifty fifty on it now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I used to recruit a lot in Germany. In Germany, it's a very normal thing. Everyone has a um, professional headshot on their CV. Mm-hmm. I really really think it depends on your on your on your cv or resume um because there's there's some really good templates out there from canva and other places where to be honest it it looks pretty good and i use them myself when putting things together um but it it doesn't really matter i think it just depends Mm. it's it's personal preference um and it and it could lead to more bias one way or another um so yeah I, i definitely agree with certain information doesn't need to be on a cv and i've seen some horrific information on cvs like passport details and other oh, things Lord. like that and this is and that's from security professionals and um, um and two dogs and a and a child and uh yeah don't need all of those no um oh, so it's it's yeah it doesn't really matter um i think it just comes down to personal preference Cool. Chris has a question. I've got another one. Um, regarding the resume format, should we go for traditional word format or follow from Canva? Oh. Sorry, not familiar with that. Uh, yeah, you, you can just download a PDF version. Oh, okay. So um, I, I just, um, honestly, as a recruiter, um, we just suggest plain, simple word format because at the end of the day, when we are sending it to the client, every recruiter has their own format to send it to. So we don't, unfortunately, use any of the prettiest work that you've done. So if you use a plain, simple word format, use dot points, keep it simple, have the same layout throughout the, the resume, it makes our job very, very easy to send it to, to, to the clients. Another question. What about industry standings like fellowships and those kind of you know, profile things? Yeah, they're definitely um, the sorts of things that you would want to have on your resume. They're the types of things that can make you stand out. Um, For instance, if you're a graduate uh, applying for a role, um, you might not have a lot of work experience to put into your resume. So um, associations that you're part of or projects that you've worked on as part of uni, uh, volunteer information um, can be important. But again, um, tailor it to your personal situation and what the client is looking for. But it can be an opportunity to stand out. Massively. Uh, hiring managers love people that are involved in the community. And the thing is, whether you're a student or whether you're working, what you're studying, what you're working on isn't ref- doesn't reflect your true interests. The things you do in your spare time does, and it shows your passion, shows that you're investing your time, money or both. And that's what people want. People are passionate and self-learners. Um, it turns out that Canva is some sort of design tool, thanks to Sarah explaining. Um, next question. Objective statements, do or don't? I don't have a... Again, Chris? The question is, objective statements do or don't question mark yeah I, I think you know if you have a very clear objective in mind by all means put it in again make sure it's tailored to the role that you're applying for um here comes that attention to detail <laughs> again <laughs> Surabhi, i think you were telling me uh yesterday about a situation someone put yeah. something in I had a funny, um, I had a graphic designer or a UX designer kind of a CV um, and she worked in federal government years ago and then moved into doing some work in beauty industry. So she had not tailored her CV and it says she, her objective statement said, I want to gain a position in the beauty industry and we were applying for a federal government role. Um, Yeah, that's (laughs) attention to details. Again, going back to the same basic, tailor your CV, Make sure it's relevant to the job that you're applying for. 
honestly, for me, ob unless there is an objective statement that's matching the organizational goals, there is no need for it because everyone wants to get a good job. Everyone wants to, you know, contribute to the organizational goals. If you're writing that, it's it's honestly not making any difference. Everyone's hardworking and blah blah blah. It's <laughs> just... <laughs> Two question, Eric. Um, what is your advice for keywords? in resume to stand out? Um, I'm happy to uh, respond to that one. Uh, don't just do a big long list of all the things, all the keywords, um, that's not gonna work. Uh, don't hashtag everything, because uh, you think it's currently relevant. Um, use the opportunity when you're describing um, and so you might use the, the star principle where you're describing an experience um, make sure that there's a smattering of those words in there but do be careful not to over use jargon mm. just to add to that like it's again like it keeps going back to the same thing if you use if you're reading a job description and they've said um, we need someone with the leadership skills and being able to manage the team. Uh, use those words. Tell your CV to use those words to, to write your CVs. You could have completely different synonym for leadership, but use those words. Make it make it more relevant. More let make it more reliable to the person who's actually reading it. Okay, Ricky. Nothing to add. I, I spot on. Um, yeah. So, so again, play to your strengths and what, what you bring to the role. Next question. A recruiter suggested to me to have a series of dot points at the start of the resume that outlines achievements and uh, key skills. What are your thoughts on this? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's that's where exactly you're gonna you're gonna um, attract you know that thirty second reading time or first two pages. That's where you're gonna attract someone um, to to follow on from you know reading onto your second page or third page. But as long as it's relevant, um, you know you don't want to see um, achieving in your sporting competition when you're applying for a cyber security role. Make it relevant. Great. Okay, uh, recommended font, size, and styles. I think just one that's not ugly on the eye and not too big or too small. Um. Yeah, government will actually often uh, give strict guidelines as to the font size that you can use. Um, sometimes they will give you a, a font type, um, but Certainly, uh, don't try and make your resume two pages by reducing the font size to five. <laughs> I, I had someone do that recently. <laughs> Nikki, because you're accepting only two page CVs. Oh, if, 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 they, if they don't put the effort in, that's up to them. <laughs> Yeah, look, um, white space is a good thing in a in a resume. So don't don't try and jam it all in there. If you need to, go to that third page or go to the fourth page. Okay, thanks. One more question here. Do you only include the last 10 slash 20 years when you have more experience on your CV? That's a good question. So I'm the eldest here, so I think I'll answer that one. <laughs> I can, I can sympathise with those who have nearly 30 years' experience. How do you how do you condense that? Um, look, I think I touched on it a little bit earlier, and that is that the last three to five years of your experience is most likely to be most relevant. Yeah. Um, so give a lot more detail there. Then you might give slightly less detail on the next, you know, 10 years or so. Uh, and then you might just move to uh, a time frame, an organisation and a job title for the last 10 years, if, if that's kind of helpful. Yeah. So ombre your resume. <laughs> And also sometimes when if you've had a massive career change 10 years ago and the last 20 years is not relevant, you can put just a simple line, the further, you know, history can be provided on request or 
if it's relevant, I would say put it in a table or just, you know, have one line that I've done this job in these kind of industries and these are the kind of roles that I've held. Um, yeah, and maybe if you know the demographic of the role you're applying for, right, you can, you can tailor that. So there's no hard and fast rule again. Just see what role you're applying for, how relevant it is. What what are some unconscious bias uh, that we might need to pay attention to here? So the standards, I would say, um, you know, you don't want to put your date of birth on there. You don't want to put your uh, gender. Um, the, you know, they're the ba the basic ones. Um, I think if you read through your own resume and you think, oh, that that might be um, shining me in a particular light, um, and you don't feel comfortable with that, don't don't include it. Um, but if you're um, proud and it's relevant and it's a passion um, that you were a clergyman um, from 1990 to 2000, then then leave it in. Um, I, I think people are, are quite a lot more open these days. Um, that's probably it. I think um, putting your visa status in there is a good idea because um, people could get overlooked for roles because people might assume they don't have PR or full working rights. So like, unfortunately, a lot of students will sh struggle with this if they, if they can only work part time. And it's horrible having to tell people that I just never see part-time roles. Um, and for those that are fortunate to have PR and things like that, I think it's, it's a selling point. It, it can help them land a job. Mm. Um, next question. And they're, they're coming through and pick, pick it. Um, your suggestions to make resume look appropriate to the role and not appear over experienced. Um, I'll add to that. I just had recently um, someone uh, applying for a role which was a little bit um, a lower level role or a sideways role um, than what they were doing before. They didn't obviously had to lie in their CV, but they used the words very appropriately rather than leading everywhere. Um, it was more assisting and helping and those kind of, you can use those words very smartly so that you still, you still portray the right picture. You still, but the English is such a vast language. You can, you can say the same sentence in two <laughs> different ways, right? So use your words. Um, if you're applying to a recruiter, use their help. And um, yeah, so we, we ended up getting an interview for that person, you know, um, and we've, you know, we've, um, um, giving them some tips to go for an interview that don't lie anything, but you just have to use your words very carefully that you're not going to come across that I'm going to take over your job project manager mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to help you assist. Yeah. I think um, a good, a good cover letter can help as well. So yeah. exp explaining a situation and I think often cover letters get overlooked. Um, but to make it clear, because the thing is, the thing is not everybody wants a promotion or someone might actually want to go backwards in terms of, what is perceived as the career ladder, but they might want to go back to being a, a hands-on role or they are stressed out with their current role and don't need that leadership responsibility anymore. So I think articulating that the right way can be helpful. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point, Ricky. Um, I've actually just done that myself. So I've taken a significant step back uh, to take the role here at, at People Bank to focus back more on technology recruiting uh, and to take away the stresses of what was a lot of travel, uh, now no travel, but <laughs> not to worry, uh, <laughs> with a young family. And um, uh, I was fortunate that I was able to verbally discuss that um, with the people who were doing the recruitment at that time. But a good cover letter can really explain why you're applying for the role um, and um, to, you can be more clear about those transitional skills, the transferable skills, um, and just be honest. Mm. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, do you recommend using a skills matrix? Um, 
again, it depends what role you're applying for technical roles. You have, there's no need for doing a skills metrics if you've got only like, you know, one, one year of experience and they're asking for five or something like that. If it's relevant, it is, um, I always recommend people using their skills, technical skills in their jobs descriptions. Because we see a lot of people put, um, I've done X, Y, Z, like, I'll just give an example, like a .NET developer would have put probably .NET and C Sharp and everything in there, but they might not have, they might have touched it 10 years ago, right? I still have probably in my CV that I've done automation testing, guys, but I, have I done it last 10 years? No, I haven't. So skills metrics is only relevant if you're using the same skills and replicating that to your current role descriptions and responsibilities. Otherwise, you could have done it 10 years ago. Wouldn't make any difference, yeah. Uh, next question. References to be added within resume or provided later? I think unless it, it asks for references on there, like if it's government or something, then I'd say no, because you don't need to put people's reference names and contact details on your CV. Yeah, I'd agree, because uh, if you have got those referees on your resume, um, you need to be prepared that you've provided that information uh, and a recruiter or a hiring manager or a HR can just pick up the phone to them straight away without giving you an opportunity to advise them uh, that they're going to get a call about a particular role with a particular organisation and this is why you're applying and what you might uh, be hopeful that they would say on your behalf. So uh, once you give up that information in your resume, um, you lose control of when those individuals might be called. Mm. Uh, next question, professional skills such as time management, self-motivation, leadership, communication, etc. Are these really necessary on a resume or just space waster? I think space waster. But unless, un yeah, unless, unless um, the role you're applying for needs, um, you know, the mention in their selection criteria, time management and leadership, and, and you can actually demonstrate that in your roles and responsibilities, not just writing dot points, I have time, because everyone has apparently good communication skills and everyone has good time management and leadership skills. Yeah, people want to see outcomes. So yeah. examples that demonstrate those words, then yes. But if you can't do that, then no. Um, this isn't a question, but just an idea. Um, I have columns uh, to fit my experience onto two pages. The older experience is under a heading, various other positions, so many years. Um, and that's just bullet points without actual duties. Is that an idea that might help some others to deal with the less relevant and to fit it on the pages? Yeah, um, great technique. Next question. What advice do you have in addressing the selection criteria? Um, I might take this one on because it's very government. <laughs> um, so using the STAR method um, to respond to selection criteria is, is your best way. So what you're doing is you're taking a situation and describing that briefly. You're talking about the task. You're talking about um, the actions that, that you took. Um, or how you contributed and then what the result was or the outcome or the achievement. Um, that doesn't need to be war and peace. Uh, and in fact, selection criteria responses will often uh, dictate the number of words that you can use. Um, and so you, again, be concise. Um, don't use lots and lots of flowery words unless you're applying for an English literature professor position. Right? So. <laughs> Yeah, just to add to that, like, just do not use just high level statement. We say so many times, uh, we get this statement, yep, I have, or they want, sometimes they even start with, yes, I have the skills, or I have used these skills. Um, to give an example of a project that you've done, um, you know, and then use that, as Nicole said, star method, you don't have to necessarily break it down to S-T-A-R, but yes, if you use that in your head, use that as a situation that at this particular project, I did this and that achieved this outcome and this is what the outcomes were, yeah. Yes, the next question is about STAR. 
you're right. I'm <laughs> there, so both of you. Most of the time we come across, oh, sorry. Uh, do we use the STAR method every time? Uh, as most companies are now following this. It's good practice, I guess, uh, as Surabhi mentioned, you're giving a real life example of uh, how you've applied whatever the criteria is that they're looking for. Um, also, what it demonstrates is good, clear, uh, written communication. Uh, when you can follow a method like that. So it's no different to, you know, think back to high school or uni when you're writing a, a, an essay. You have a beginning, you have a middle and you have an end. And that's really kind of um, the basic concept, I guess. Um, dot points are, are okay as well if you're wanting to get across a lot of information in a, um, in a short space. Uh, you might have a word count. Uh, requirement to meet there. So dot points are also okay, but do make sure um, that you're very clear about uh, that example, your contribution uh, to that, and then what the outcome was. If there's um, space, you might even talk in the outcomes about what the learnings were. So it might be an opportunity for you to um, show some of your vulnerability. Um, you don't want to up on yourself, uh, but, uh, but it might be one of those opportunities where you can describe uh, how you've had learning or growth um, throughout your career there as well. Great. Um, most of the time we come across openings that require experienced candidates. Is it recommended to apply anyway, though you don't have enough experience? And I'll chip in here. When I was trying to leave the police and struggling because everybody had me boxed into wearing a blue uniform and working in the commissioner's office and so on, I did struggle to leave. So one of the things that I did that was very radical, I applied for a job that was about four levels above where I should have been. But it attracted so much interest from the boss who thought, who is this person who would dare to apply for this job that she's wildly underqualified for? And he invited me in for a cup of tea. And he offered me a job that was appropriate to my level, but at least I knew the boss. And he thought, my goodness, this is an interesting person. And it turned out he'd done quite a bit of research with, about me with his colleagues, because I was moving into an area where I'd done some work with his team. Very quickly he worked out, yes, yes, we'll have you, <laughs> but not at that exaggerated level <laughs> it was more like your job Nicole it was the general manager of Ignite kind of equivalent and was a starting recruiter to give you a similar example but anyway if any of you have got another good example I think it just comes down back to networking like you know again um, like you know or uh, picking up the phone and see if you can speak to someone and talk about your relevant experience um, I um, on that note, I want to add like a lot of people are hesitant to call, um, you know, you see an ad, there's a recruitment consultant details in there. You just think, oh, um, I feel too scared to apply, um, to call. I'm just going to apply and see what happens because you don't want to face that re rejection over the phone or, you know, but we would love to talk to you. I mean, um, sometimes we might not be able to, you know, take all calls straight away, but we will try to return your calls as soon as possible. Talk to them and and actually discuss and then we might go oh okay we don't think you'll be suitable for this role but i have another role that you might be suitable for and that's where you build as nicole said before build your relationship with your recruitment consultants because they will help you find something sooner rather than later <laughs> hopefully it worked for me i got a five thousand dollar a year um, raise by moving sideways and wow other role and that was in the 80s so 5,000 a year is a noticeable sum of money so sometimes being a bit gutsy yeah. <laughs> I think also again it goes back to having a good cover letter because someone could be transitioning from who a developer to become maybe an application security developer or engineer and they have a very relevant skill set and if you can demonstrate I've got this background and I'm doing this additional learning on the side that's a great combination and that can be the same for other roles as well. Yeah. I've worked I just with like his team extensively, so he, he knew what I could do. <laughs> I'd just like to also add that um, sometimes there's a fear for applying for a role. Um, it, uh, 
if there's 10 selection criteria and you only meet nine and a half of them and you think I'm not good enough and you don't apply, um, mm. this is real, um, particularly uh, for female applicants. Uh, we like to think we can already successfully do the job and probably the level above before we all will apply for the role. <laughs> um, as Surabhi's mentioned, you know, pick up the phone, have a conversation, find out of those 10 criteria, which are the most important? Do you meet those? Um, do you only meet five of those criteria and how can you Im um, improve or grow or work on the skills to get the, the other five tick boxed as well? Uh, or what transferable skills do you have that might mean that you could get over the line? So don't discount something just because you feel like you're not already an expert in it. And, and often there's a, again, like a list of uh, requirements not all of them are actually required so it might be three out of the ten are actually the key ones but you don't know that on the job description and as a recruiter we will qualify this with a, with a manager over the phone or in person so we know those two three things they are actually looking for and the rest are nice to haves so you may have those necessary skills um, and the stuff you don't have are just desirables anyway so it's, it's always again what's the worst case scenario uh, lot, lots of thank yous because people are dropping. Yeah. I think we've got another. Oh, yeah. someone was telling me a similar story. Um, her partner got a, a job he didn't think he was qualified for. He got it. He was offered a huge pay rise and training. <laughs> Something <laughs> to work too. That's it. Love it. We've run out of questions. Oh, brilliant. Very good. Um, well, <laughs> Thank many you. thanks. Many, yes. many thank you as people have been leaving. Yes, many, many thanks. And for those of us who are still on the call, if you would like um, any of our panellists to do a bit of one-on-one -on -one with you to finesse that resume, um, please reach out to them directly via LinkedIn. Um, I'll give you each the last word uh, after I say thank you. And I can't say thank you enough times. Um, because you've put a lot of work into today and your advice is very, very valuable. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, last word, best resume tip. Nicole, far away. <laughs> okay, use the KISS principle. Okay, so keep it simple, concise. Ricky? I think be specific. Know, know what you're applying for and sell yourself, sell your, sell your strengths and what you bring to that role. Awesome. And Subi, you get the last word. Yeah, I just say that read the roles and responsibilities, tell your CV um, and use those keywords used in the job description to, to write your CV. Thanks, everyone. See Thank you another you. day. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.